So he had heard about him, this great master, and he was determined to find him. The direction seemed a little odd. He found himself in a swamp. It was pretty slimy. Didn't seem to be anybody there. He's looking around, and he's looking around, and he sees a little green creature and says, excuse me, excuse me, I'm I'm looking for a great master. Could you tell me where I might find him? Green creature looks back and says, found him, you have. (laughs) And Luke Skywalker looks at Yoda and says, I'm sorry, but you're so small. I'm looking for a great Jedi master. And Yoda says, judge me by my size, do you? Size matters not. And thus begins the discipleship of Luke Skywalker. They worked together intensely, Yoda and Luke. The times were urgent. The times were indeed quite worrisome. This rebellion against the empire was building, and Luke knew he was needed to help be a leader in this. He was young. He was pretty hot-headed. He was angry. And he knew he could do this. After trying to prove to Yoda he was indeed up to the task and worthy, he failed a few times miserably. Yoda finally looks at him and says, You must unlearn what you have learned. So under Yoda's tutelage, Luke learns many things. His own goal of becoming a Jedi Knight, though, required him to do a lot more than physical work. Yes, he got in really great shape, but the hardest stuff he had to do was really the mental and spiritual preparation for this kind of thing. As the training went on, there came a point where it was time for Luke to do the really, really hard thing, harder than any of the real physical battles he would fight. He had to go into the cave. He says to Yoda, what will I find in there? And Yoda says, only what you take with you. So, of course, Luke takes with him probably what most of us would take into a cave like this. That is all the unnamed fears, all the fears for his future, all the demons from the past. He walks into the cave, and, of course, he sees Darth Vader, and they have a lightsaber duel. And Luke apparently, supposedly wins this battle. Off comes Vader's head, but instead of Vader, there's Luke's head behind the Mask of Terror. Turns out one of Luke's fears was, well, becoming that. Becoming that power-hungry. Becoming someone who could abuse power like that. Yes, Luke had to face that demon before he could be of any use in the world and in this effort. And Leota says, well, named must your fear be before you can banish it. And then, of course, the greatest gift that Luke, that Yoda gave Luke, was to help him discern and figure out what was the force and what was the dark side. Luke asks, well, is the dark side stronger than the force? Yoda says, no, but it is quicker, it is easier, it is more seductive. It comes to you really quickly in a rush, in a fight. But no, it's not stronger. It's what comes to you when you're really angry. But watch out. Because the force is calm, and there's peace, and there's a tranquility, even in the midst of everything around you being anything but. And Yoda says, a Jedi uses the force for knowledge and defense, never for attack. The discipleship of Luke Skywalker. You can probably tell I am a Star Wars fan. I get the sense that perhaps there are a few of you out there as well. Well, as a kid, about the only thing I cared about on Christmas, as far as gifts under the tree, was I just wanted the newest Star Wars figure that had been released that year or that month. I still have all those. Even in high school, this is a little embarrassing to admit, but even in high school, I would really sort of sort 
who I might consider dating and who I wouldn't, dependent upon, were they going to be okay with hanging out and watching the trilogy on a Saturday night? I was also a church kid, grew up in a really um, interesting and big and very alive Pentecostal kind of church. So for a church kid like me, who also was a huge Star Wars fan, when it came time for me to learn about the Holy Spirit and to be able to understand the sort of abstract concept, well, I mean, it was real clear to me that, duh, the Holy Spirit was the force. (laughs) Obviously. Apologies to theologians everywhere and certainly to George Lucas. But for me, it worked. Even sometimes watching the trilogy for the tenth time, one character would say to another, may the force be with you. I would sometimes find myself saying back to the TV, and also with you. (laughs) As if this were a liturgical moment. Also for a church kid like myself, I was really drawn to this relationship between Yoda and Luke. And it struck me that it was a lot like Jesus' relationship with his disciples, and a lot like Paul's relationship, Paul the Apostle, with his disciples. There was this teacher-student kind of connection that empowered folks for really important big things, but it also changed them. It changed the people along the way. It changed them into folks who were more content, even in the midst of a lot of hard stuff, folks who were more peaceful, more grounded. It was as if, if you watched all of the trilogy at the end, you could really see that Luke became the kind of person that he had been loved into being. He was orphaned, and then he lost his his aunt and uncle. He had no one, but he was loved into being by this teacher So here in our passage today in Matthew, we have the first encounter of Jesus with the folks who would be his disciples. And he says two things. He says, follow me, and I will make you, I will make you into fishers of people. Now, if they were church growth scouts out looking for talent, looking for folks who might become the next founders of this great movement that would eventually become the church, I seriously doubt they would have chosen these guys. These are a bunch of Galilean peasants. But yes, indeed, these were the folks who actually founded the church as we know it. But Jesus didn't say I call you because of what you already are, or I call you because of all the great things you've done. He said, I call you as you are right now. Just follow me and I will take care of the rest, actually. Your thing is to follow. Are you ready? Are you open? Are you ready to unlearn the things you have learned? We get glimpses glimpses along the way of how they grow and how they fail and how they get up again, and how they learn what it means to be this messy, complicated community that does not love each other perfectly, but continues to work to love each other. We see how their own personal transformation led to societal transformation, because they did indeed become fishers of people. If they hadn't, we wouldn't be here. We are some of those fish all the way down all those years This fall, we're talking about discipleship. It's our theme. And the reality is is that sometimes progressive churches don't talk too much about personal transformation and discipleship. We talk a lot about societal transformation. We talk a lot about alleviating suffering, fighting for justice. We talk a lot about, and we do a lot, to give voice to people that don't have voice. All the things that Roxanne was saying... I mean, that is beautiful, and that is what we do, and it is who we are. Certainly, this is what Christ calls us to. But do we know that we're also called to personal transformation, that we can only free others as much as we ourselves are free, that we can only love others as much as we allow ourselves to be loved? 
Personal transformation leads to the reduction of toxic ego. It leads to being willing to let go of anger and of bitterness and of resentment and to open to compassion and forgiveness and to be clearer channels for God to do God's thing in the world. And sometimes in more conservative churches, there's a lot of focus on personal transformation and not much focus on societal transformation. Sometimes in more conservative churches, the real goal is freedom from sin and guilt to find joy and empowerment through Christ and the church. And then that's it. And I think they're missing something too. I think that if that's where folks stop, that they're only living into half of what they're called to live into. And I know I'm painting, I'm sure, too much of a black and white picture. That's really, it's not totally like that. That's just sort of a general sense. But I do believe that the combination of personal and communal transformation that informs acts of mercy and justice is where the power is, that getting these two things together is where the sweet spot is for the church in the future. I think that's the integration that the big, big church is called to. So, about this discipleship thing. We're talking about Bible times. We're talking about, like, Plato and Aristotle and Jesus and John the Baptist. How in the world is discipleship a relevant thing for us today? We don't really live in a society where folks just drop everything and go follow a teacher. Every now and then people do that, but that's not most of us. Most of us find ourselves juggling parents and children, dishes and laundry and business trips, and generally endless lists of to-dos. The day in and the day out of life can be wonderful, and it can be hard and tiring as well. So what does discipleship have to do with us more common folks, us non-Jedi types? I think that it actually has a lot to offer. I think that discipleship and putting ourselves in the position of being a student always, of being willing to grow in the way, can bring meaning to the day day in and day out of our lives in a way that nothing else can. It gives us community. It strengthens our relationship with God. It helps us know ourselves better and to be more honest with ourselves, to go into our own caves and deal with what we need to, and to come out and be loved by each other. So I think discipleship actually is quite relevant for us today. But what does this mean? Some thoughts about a practicality of this. We all need to find teachers. We all need, and some of you probably have teachers. You may not even know that they're your teachers. Maybe it's a favorite poet. Maybe it's Rumi or Hafiz or Mary Oliver or Saint Anne Lamont. You know who your teachers are is my guess. There's also a profession called spiritual direction, which offers wonderful teachers. There's also the church. That's also what we do here for each other. You can learn ways of praying that can turn the daily tasks of life into simple prayers, that can turn the dailiness of life itself into a spiritual act. Also, you can keep coming to church because every Sunday, Tom and I are going to be touching on some type of some aspect of discipleship. Also, you can talk to us about it, too. So Jesus calls and says, follow me, and I will make you fishers of people. And the you there is, of course, as it most often is in the Greek, second person plural. It's a good old y'all. Which means we're in it together. We're in the net together, friends. It's like Jesus is saying, all right, Union Kong, follow me from the inside out, and people won't be able to stay away. If you follow me and submit yourselves to this process, to this love, you will shine. And what is our response? Do we drop our nets immediately and do we go? And follow? 
Or do we say, as we see in other parts of the Gospels, do we say, no, no, let me bury my dead a little bit more. Let me say a few more goodbyes and then I'll come. Only you know the answer to that. The call is there, though, and it never expires, and we can't avoid it forever. A simple yes is all it takes. We throw our hat in the ring, and we go, and God does the rest. And I, for one, vote for following. How about you? Oh, and may the force be with you.